Right, chapter 25. So they've, they're about to step onto the rainbow temple wheel. They stepped into a large compartment at the bottom of the wheel. On the outside, the crystal gleamed with rainbow colours, but on the inside it was so clear. Lucky felt he could see forever through it. The guards closed the gate and the compartment rose into the air, lifting slowly and smoothly off the ground. Professor Bazantine and Froelich stood on one side. The professor was talking in hushed tones about the Twelve Estrellas, and Froelich was listening intently, looking out at the world as they rose higher and higher. Bixer helped Lucky over to the other side of the compartment. It was, he was still unsteady, his body ached after his fireworks. Together they watched the planet gradually reveal itself before them. They were already high enough to have a clear view into the next valley. An enormous amphitheatre had been carved out of the hillside, as big and wide as the hill itself. A huge crowd of people thronged around it, buzzing with excitement, watching the wheel. The view was so clear, Lucky could still see individuals in the crowds below. He was becoming aware just how diverse the axa were. Though the men all had horns, some had great curving crescents, while others sported short, sharp spikes. The women's hair was all different too, and so were their eyes. Lucky could see every shade of flame imaginable, and features just as varied as human features. Even so, he couldn't help noticing a couple of axes who seemed out of place, two burly men with metal piercings in their faces and brandings on their arms. That's strange, he thought. They look a lot like those pirates who boarded the ship, the pirates who I killed. Hey, he said to Bixer, didn't the professor tell us there was none of Theobroma's armour here? That's right, he re she replied, silver eyes glowing as she took in the view. Then what are those two doing? asked Lucky. Bixer looked where he was pointing, but by the time she did, the men disappeared into the crowds. Which two? she said. Never mind, they're gone now. Lucky kept looking, but there was no sign of them amid the mass of people. It was becoming hard to make out individuals that were rising high all the time. They could see hills and valleys extending far into the distance, and an endless horizon stretching out beyond. The panoramic view made him feel light-headed. In this magical space, high above the world, anything seemed possible. Could you imagine the war ever ending, Vixer? he asked, the two sides making peace and not fighting any more. I don't see so much difference between them, she replied. It was so quiet up here, the only sounds were their own voices echoing off the crystal walls. Sometimes I think there's two sides in this war, but it's not humans against AXA, it's all the people who want war on one side and all the people who don't on the other. He never thought about it th thought about it like that before. On which side are you on? I'm a warrior, she said proudly, needles bristling, but I'm supposed to be a star talker one day too, right? She glanced across she glanced across at Frolix and the Professor, and her voice dropped so low that Lucky had to lean in close to hear her. You know what? Sometimes I wish I could be a star talker. You think I really like having to defend myself all the time? Imagine having a temple like this. Imagine being like Gala. But for an instant, her neon needles flashed with cobalt closed coloured light, then the colour drained away. It'll never happen, though, she said glumly. I don't have, any, have the power Mystica thinks I do. Lucky frowned. What do you mean? You're brilliant. You know everything about the stars. Sure, sure, I can talk about the theory. And it's not like I haven't tried, but I just don't feel it inside me. She shook her head. The truth is, I've never heard a star singing my whole life. You haven't? He said, surprised. He was, to he was totally silent for a moment as he took this in. Then he looked up through the crystal top of the compartment. There they were, bright and beautiful as always, a million points of silver light shining in the black. I want to, sighed Bixer, gazing up at them too. More than anything, I wish I could hear a star singing to me like Mystica and the Professor have, like even you have, she looked down again, but it will never happen, and anyway, what's the point of power if it can't save the people you love, Mystica's power couldn't save my parents from the Axa army and the Shadow Guards, now she's dying and no one can save her, soon she'll be gone and the captain too, what am I going to do then, it doesn't matter what powers I've got, how can I survive alone, Lucky knew the feelings she was talking about, knew them very well indeed, the loss of his mother went so deep inside him, he thought he was the only one who'd ever felt that way. You won't be alone, he said, not ever, Bixer, if there's anything I can do. There's nothing anyone can do, is there, she said, knuckles whitening as she clenched her fists. I hate death, I hate it. I wish I could fight it, I wish it would just come here and give me a fair fight. But death just takes people away. He doesn't care what's fair and what's not, it takes everyone in the end, it destroys everything. Look around you, Lucky, in the end, this will go back to nothing. So what's the point? She demanded bitterly, needles black as night. What's the point of anything? 
like he looked at the world, laid out beneath them like a tapestry or an open book. He could see it all, its hills and valleys, its wrinkles and folds, its rolling ups and downs. From this perspective, turning silently in the sky, all of it seemed beautiful, all of it alive. I'm not sure, he admitted, but just because it's going to die one day, doesn't mean it's not worth fighting for. Maybe it matters even more because it's all we've got. He looked straight into her eyes, and there's, the, and there's no one who could fight it, fight for it better than you, Bixa Quicksilver. Her needles widened at that, and a little colour came back into her needles. Her eyes widened at that, and a little colour came back into her needles. They were near the top of the wheel now, and the view was beyond breathtaking. Lucky could see the curve of the planet itself here. For the first time he really understood what it meant to be on, the, on a world. He could almost feel it turning, like the wheel, a globe of life, life and light. Life and light, moving through the vastness of space, so fragile yet so alive. He looked at Bixer, looking at the world. Click. The compartment opened. They turned to look into outside, and there, on a platform at the top of the wheel, stood Carla, star talker of the future. She was just as intense in real life as she seemed on the vid screens. She was dressed all in black. Long, dark hair hung over her face, but as she saw them coming out of the compartment, she threw her head back and her hair parted to reveal her eyes. They blazed every colour of the spectrum at once, from ultraviolet to infrared, eyes like diamond fire. Old friend, she called as the professor bowed gallantly before her, while Bazooka shivered on his shoulder. I've waited so long for you to return, and now here you are, bringing those who will shape the future. She beamed at Bixer and Frolix, who both looked starstruck, and then she turned to look at Lucky with her rainbow-coloured eyes. She stared at him openly, nakedly, like the other Star Talkers did, and the gaze seemed to reach directly into his brain. Thank you for your fireworks, she said. I know how much they cost you. Lucky felt confused. He could feel the wind on his face, could feel how high up they were. From the stars we all came, he began. And to the stars we returned, said Carla. Perhaps sooner than we expect. She turned back to the Professor. So tell me, friend, what brings you here at last? Many mysteries lie before us, Gala, said the Professor. We hope you will be able to unravel them. You seek knowledge? She held out her hands out wide, embracing the vast view all around them. Then you have come to the right place. Ask, and I shall answer. Those supernova flashes in the sky, said the Professor. Have you seen them? I have seen them and I hear them. Right here I feel them. She touched her heart. The death throes of a star in my dreams, the twelve, astra twelve astraeus sing of little else. Professor nodded briskly. We are searching for the twelve, he said. Mystica and I both feel sure they are on at hand. The signs are everywhere. Indeed, Gala sighed, having her uh, hair waving in the wind. But are you looking in the right place? And where would the right place be, said the Professor, a little stiffly. Would it be per perchance be in Aquarius, behind the government's blockade? She closed her eyes. Aquarius, she murmured. So many things are hidden there, but all of them will be found. Ah, the professor looked rather pleased with himself. And the wolf that eats the stars? I cannot say. I feel it and I fear it, yet its nature is, is as mysterious to me. I see it devouring suns one by one. But what is it? Do not ask me, for I do not know. Even the king, with all his faith and fury, cannot stop it, though his great weapon is coming to him, closer all the time. She opened her eyes and turned to Lucky. And you, strange boy? You have a question for me? Me? Lucky breathed in sharply. This was the chance he'd been waiting for ever since his meeting with the President. Well, I'm looking for my father, he told her. I heard he was on the planet Charon. Or Sharon. Do you know where that is? Carla scowled. There are secrets even I do not know, she said, and yet you have your father, Astrolabe? Lucky's skin prickled. How did she know that? He pulled it out and showed it to her. I've been trying to use it to find him, he said. The problem is, whenever I ask about him, it throws me off the edge of the map. She reached out and took the astrolabe. Off the edge, she echoed. That must, that must be something uncharted, unknown, something yet to come. This is my, that is my domain, boy. If you have the courage to go there, I say you will find your father and more. How, asked Lucky, how do I do that? Leave the astrolabe with me, she replied. I will ask my star, the Scorpio star. I will ask it in song about your father and all those questions, and I will tell you what it sings in reply. She gestured towards the amphitheatre over the next hill. I'm singing tonight, a great concert for my people, who are all invited as my honoured guests. At the end of the song, seek me out and I will tell you what the stars have told me. Thank you, said Lucky. Beside him, Professor Byzantine stroked his whiskers thoughtfully. 
while Vixen unfurled its grin, their eyes wide and starry bright. But Garda shook her head, and her eyes flashed like a diamond prism. Thank me, he said, she said. I am not sure you will. Are you absolutely certain you wish to find him? Of course, said Lucky. I'd do anything to see him. See him again? What do you mean, Gala? Asked the professor. Surely Lucky has to find his father, for only he knows the truth about the boy's power. Only he has the answers. On the contrary, she said. In the end, the boy must find the answers for himself in himself. No father can tell him what to do. It is not apparent that he needs, but that which is already, but that which is already inside him. She turned back to Lucky. Let me see what is inside you, boy. Let me feel your heart. She reached a hand up to Lucky's chest. Her fingers had long curving nails, painted black, tapering to points. They were very sharp indeed. He hesitated, feeling scared of her, but he wanted her to help even more. So he stayed still and let Gala touch him. She closed her eyes. I feel it, she whispered after a long moment. I see it rising inside you. She looked at Professor Bazantine in amazement. Her eyes flashed every colour at once. It cannot be. Can it? Pause for one moment. <laughs>